I'm Ann Watley, and I'm excited to be here and to have this conversation. Um, why don't we start with just quick intros for everybody to give uh, everyone a little context on uh, your experience and how it relates to individual assistance. Uh, I'm Kate Bolger. I'm with Money Management International. We have a program called Project Porchlight, where we help people navigate kind of the bureaucratic financial processes for disaster, and a lot of that involves uh, getting people through individual assistance. I'm Claire Balsley with SBP. Uh, I'm director over our disaster assistance program that specifically helps disaster survivors access more funds from FEMA through FEMA appeals. Our goal is to ensure that every survivor receives their maximum eligible amount of funding. And I'm Melissa Bauer. Um, I am the Integrated Health and Outreach Director for Santiam Hospital, and part of that is overseeing our disaster case management services that started in 2020 um, due to the Beachy Creek Lion's Head wildfire. So you've got a lot of experience, and I, I want to, in a lot of different environments, so I'm interested to hear what you think are some of the key uh, aspects that a community needs if they're setting up a system to provide assistance. So what do you think that every community should know uh, to, to set them up for success? I'm happy, sorry. Um, so I think the first thing they need to think about is that, um, you know, these processes of applying for aid, applying for really all uh, aid programs and grant programs after a disaster are super bureaucratic and that most people who are applying for these funds do not have experience working through highly bureaucratic systems. And so I tell people, you know, think back to the first time you had to file your, your taxes, right? Um, first off, you probably had somebody to help you through it, which was really helpful. But second off, like, it felt really scary, even though you were probably getting a refund back, right? There's a lot of pressure around that. And if you get it wrong, there's this fear that things could go very sideways for you. That's the same thing that folks are feeling as they're filling out these applications, right? And so providing some sort of structure to give them assistance getting through it is really critical in getting them to do it. Uh, so that would be my first piece of advice. One thing that um, I think is really important for every community to understand is that FEMA assistance lasts for about 18 months. Obviously, recovery takes much longer than 18 months. After FEMA provides their assistance, Housing and urban development could come into the community to provide a community development block grant disaster recovery fund. The funds that HUD provides a community is directly correlated with how much money FEMA provides the individual. So if survivors do not apply to FEMA and if they do not appeal any denial or low ward amount, that is less money that the community as a whole will receive through those CDBGDR funds. I'm just gonna answer that from a little bit of a different perspective of, of a disaster case management program. Um, my advice, if you're just starting out like with recovery, is to one, just listen to your survivors and listen to what the community needs and build that trust because that trust is what's going to allow that survivor to work with your case manager through that recovery. Um, and have a central resource center. Sorry, this slide. Um, we, we were really fortunate to be able to have our, um, the hospital employed disaster case managers right away. Um, we had a hub set up where donations were coming in, where families could come in and charge um, their phones. They could get replacement phones. Uh, we, we had people there to navigate services right away. Um, and we had other bridging that social services and disaster um, services. So we had um, ODHS there, like our, our Oregon Department of Human Services, to be able to help people apply for food stamps because people have never had to apply for those before and they didn't feel like they wanted to go into a state office. And so bring those services to the people 
and work together with all of your providers that'll kind of a one-stop shop so um because as you know like survivors lose their transportation they lose their id they need to be able to um, not be traveling all over the different counties for support so bringing everybody together under one hub um, and then Starting up a private fund would be my advice. We um, were fortunate to be able to have a private fund set up and we worked really closely with our community foundation um, for Oregon and to teach us how to distribute those funds. But our case managers just two days after the fire were able to access those funds and replace like immediate durable medical equipment and um, birth certificates and such like that. So my advice is really just to listen to the community and then develop your program around their needs. So uh, some of you all touched on this. When we're talking about uh, challenges, creating on-ramps to really get people uh, engaged in their in their recovery effort can be difficult. Uh, so you have to meet them where they are when they're ready for help. So what are some strategies that you can share, or even if they get the denial uh, a letter, how do you keep them engaged? Sorry, Anne. Um, so one of the things we do with our program is, uh, after that initial sort of intake where they're talking with a HUD certified counselor, um, that counselor is gonna help them set goals, very small goals, and then follow up with them as soon as those the consumer thinks that they can complete those goals. And having that person, who's following up, who's finding out how did that go. Um, they're calling, you know, we're not waiting for the consumer to, to reach out to us, we're always reaching out to them. Um, but then asking them, you know, how did it go? If it didn't go well, let's reset, let's find a way to get around it. If it did go well, having, we call it a party on the phone, uh, most of our services are delivered by phone. Um, but having that little party on the phone to kind of gas them up about what they did is really important because it doesn't feel like you're getting a lot of wins even when you're doing all the right things and there's setbacks throughout. And so helping folks kind of have that sense that they have achieved something is really helpful. Um, also, you know, I mentioned we deliver a lot of service on the phone. We also do a lot of work via text message, via email. When consumers are working with us, they're frequently not able to um, take additional time out of their day to go somewhere. And so that's been our solution. But I think trying to find not just, um, you know, the, the type of services they're accessing, but how they're accessing those services and giving them a variety of choices for us has been really important at getting folks to engage who would not otherwise be able or be willing to engage. One thing that we've noticed for, especially the marginalized communities, is when you receive a determination letter, it's somewhat confusing. And I'm saying somewhat very loosely. Um, and you see on the determination letter, you are ineligible or you are denied. And many of the survivors that we work with see those bold letters and think that's the end right? They won't read to page three of FEMA's determination letter to see that they have the chance to appeal. And if they do, they may not understand how to properly do so. So one of the things that I think is really important for communities in blue sky days is really setting up that information to case management, to uh, nonprofit organizations that are assisting in disasters during gray sky days to really emphasize that determination letters are not the end of the road and that anyone who receives a denial or low award amount can and should appeal and equipping these partner organizations, these advocates with the knowledge on how to appeal to be able to provide guidance and direction to the survivors who may not otherwise know how to do so properly. I would just add communicating with the survivors ahead of time that most likely this is going to be denied and giving them just the, the facts up front that it might be denied one, it might be denied 15 times, I'm looking at a case manager in front of me, um, but giving them, no, letting them know the expectations and then when that denial comes, being there with them and listening to their frustration because everybody takes that denial differently 
And if you have the opportunity, go to their go to their home, sit with them, have them come into the office, call FEMA together, get get exactly from the FEMA representative what is it that you're needing, and then make sure that you document that. And when that doesn't happen, push back, battle. I, <laughs> I have Patty here in front of me, and I just want to say we call her the boxer, and she has little boxing gloves because that's what you have to do. You're you're their advocate. They've fought. It's time for us to fight for them. So as you're saying, this this work is really tough and and day to day it can feel really exhausting and challenging. So what approaches have you seen used to really celebrate milestones and and track progress? And you can talk about it from either the individual level, but also community wide. What are some of the, the markers or milestones that you use? So as I mentioned already, kind of the party on the phone, right? Trying to help folks kind of count their wins and stop counting their losses or um, kind of really take a let's let's take stock of things where we are and think about forward and try not to focus on what happened um, in the past, whether that was denials or, um, you know, failed efforts throughout the recovery. Um, so that helps kind of at an individual level. Uh, the other thing we do, though, is we've got uh, so we're exclusively focused on the finances, right? Like our goal is to help people not fall backwards financially, not um, kind of uh, kind of lose ground as they're recovering. And so uh, we're very focused on the credit reports. So um, with the consumer's permission, we begin pulling their credit report throughout the recovery. We pull it every six months for several years. There's no impact to their credit. It's a soft research-based pull, um, but it does give us a lot of insight into how effective our program is. And what we know is that um, after a disaster without any kind of support uh, around their finances, the average consumer loses about 25 points on their credit score in the first year, and it continues to float down for several years after. Uh, consumers that work in our program, Project Porchlight, their credit score does not change in the first year, which is not normally something we would celebrate, but that is a huge win. Uh, and then on average, their credit score increases by about 29 points over the next two years. Um, and so we measure that. We look at... Um, you know, 90% of folks that we work with within 12 months of working with us have established safe, stable, affordable housing. Um, 98% are able to resume payments to their creditors, and more than 90% make those payments on time for the 12 months following our work. Uh, I also want to say none of what we're doing is in a vacuum. You know, we're really just focused on the money, and we describe ourselves both to consumers and to the partners that are on the ground doing that work that we work with is we're a spoke in the wheel. Like we're HUD certified counselors, specially trained for disaster. Um, many of the counselors, most of the counselors have themselves recovered from a disaster. And so uh, the results that we get, we share with our partners and encourage them to look at as their wins too, because just talking about their money isn't going to get them there. Um, so I think kind of sharing those good results is, is critical. I second that. Uh, sharing, sharing results is so important. I have a team that um, assists survivors across a number of disasters, and we keep track per disaster what the total award amounts from the appeals have been. And we celebrate together as a team every time another big award comes in, or even a small award, and emphasizing that to survivors, even if FEMA gives an award, additional award of $1,000, right, which is not very much at all, but we still want to show the survivor that it's $1,000 more than what they previously received, and we can appeal again and see what else we can try to get them. So just highly emphasizing those small wins helps move focus into a more positive light. Um, <clears throat> we... We track our wins like quantitatively, like most organizations. We have a dashboard, and but as a team, we like to really focus on the, I guess you could say, the qualitative wins. Um, but the little wins, like we celebrate those, and and I think we we probably need to get to celebrating more of those. We're in a little a little spot right now where it's hard to celebrate, but um, this is a good reminder. So. We had like Elena, another case manager that's with me, you know, ran into the office one day and was so excited jumping up and down because she got a FEMA win. Um, and we celebrated that and we put it out on so in social media to um, our followers. And 
But it's also the wins on social media, the shout outs that our team gets. And when you have a, a gentleman that wanted a red house and he finally gets his red paint on his home, those um, are the wins that we like to celebrate and share with one another that keeps us going. So we, uh, we've been talking a lot this afternoon about the importance of emotional recovery. And so I just wanted to give a chance for you all to speak a bit about how you have approached it in some of your work. Uh, so for our counselors, they're working on Project Porchlight all day, every day. They respond to all kinds of disasters. Um, and very quickly, we realized like, we will burn out our very best of our team uh, really quickly if we kept them at that pace. Um, so we did things um, both in changing kind of how their day worked, where they have the freedom to take on as many consumers as they need in a day or as, or as few as they need. They can say, you know, I can't take a new case today and that has to be okay. Um, you know, we created a, we call it kind of a chill out room in our main office where uh, counselors can go whenever they need to. It's a no questions asked. They can spend as much time in there as they need to. Um, it's very calm. They can take a, a book, whatever they need. Um, and the idea is it just gives them the space to just decompress between uh, between clients that they're working with. Um, the other thing is we do a lot of work with our EAP program. Um, and so it's, you know, they're helping us out with uh, constantly putting out learnings. We offer like uh, virtual yoga classes to folks, right? Like trying to, to help support that self-care as much as possible. Um, you know, the other thing is I think this is work that, for our team, you know, it's really close to their hearts. I mentioned that they have themselves survived a disaster uh, for the most part. Um, and so they're choosing to be on that team, which I think is important. We're a, a large company, we, we do more than just disaster work, but they really choose to be on that team. And anytime they need to, they can choose to not be a part of that team anymore. Um, and I think that's important they have that that choice and freedom. Um, it, it is a daily, um mental challenge, I think, especially for my team who hears survivor stories continually, right? Uh, we're in disasters where we have queues of over 200 survivors seeking FEMA appeals assistance and small teams in each disaster. And so hearing these stories over and over again does take a toll. And so incorporating some of the things that, um, is it Jenna, J Joni, uh, as stated, is so vital um, for the well-being of advocates like ourselves. But also we've noticed that survivors too need assistance. Um, and having just contact resources available to them is really important too. There was um, one survivor that one of my associates was calling to congratulate because this survivor received an additional $8,000 from FEMA. And as opposed to this survivor being overjoyed, she burst into tears and she said, my home is destroyed. What's $8,000? What's an additional $8,000 going to do for me? And then she threatened suicide. So we had to call in um, just officials to come and make sure that she was okay while our associate stayed on the phone with her. And so this is something that affects us and the survivors. And we never know how a survivor is going to react even to good news. And so understanding the resources, the mental health resources available is vital. I agree to that. Um, it's twofold, it's survivors and it's the team. I'll just add a couple of things that we do specifically. Um, we've lost um, a number of survivors since 2020. And so what, one thing like our team did on the recently um, was we just all gathered in the lawn and of where we worked and took time to reflect on that survivor that had passed. And, and so taking the time to also go through your own grief as a team is important. Um, and then we, as we have like, we have a mental health counselor on site for survivors and we, we utilize our local service providers as far as connecting um, survivors to those resources. Um, and we try I think it's really important as leaders to 
um, be okay when your team needs a break and pick up on those clues that they're giving you and, um, and adjust. So if they need to um, work for tens or they need to take a week off, allowing that um, and recognizing as a leader too when we need to take a step back and relax and have a couple days to just realign ourselves. All right. Uh, now I'm going to convert my microphone into a magic wand and I'm going to give you each a wish. Uh, what's one thing you would like to see changed about how, uh, FEMA and, uh, how FEMA works or how individuals interact with FEMA? Only one? Well, just one. You got to pick one. Um, so I would I would make the whole process much less bureaucratic. Like I think that there's a lot of questions that are asked that um, certainly you know the people applying for it don't know why they're being asked these things or asked to provide these things. And I think that um, having any additional complication, any additional piece of the form that you add, prevents one more person from getting the help that they need and that they deserve. And so uh, if I could get them to simplify it to just say like, hey, here's where I live, here's my name. Like I was clearly in this disaster, go ahead and give them money. And I know that there'll be some amount of fraud in that, right? Um, but I think that the the kind of moral payoff of getting everybody the money that they need and they deserve is so much better than a little bit of people lying and, and saying they were in a disaster they weren't part of. So that would be my magic wand wish. Uh, my magic wand would be to not have the job that I have. Um, I, I don't want to have to help survivors with appeals. So if there was a way to improve the initial award amount from FEMA, whether that be through more qualified inspectors who give accurate damage assessment levels or making the process just a little bit easier for survivors to understand what documents to submit right away um, or lessening the bureaucratic side of things, that would be my one wish. I think it applies to FEMA and also government, just government programs in general that have those the funds to help people. I would, it's hard to say one wish, but um, trust the individuals that have gone through the trauma and recognize that it's a trauma that they the trauma that they've endured and eliminate the bullshit red tape that every government program seems to have where it makes it impossible for survivors to feel like they're supported by who should be supporting them yeah, we feel you. We feel you. <laughs> so I wanted to give you each a chance, or at least for both uh, uh, Claire and Kate, to talk about how you work with local organizations. Yeah, so local organizations are absolutely essential to the success of our program. Um, we aren't on the ground. We are uh, kind of located all across the country. Um, but we need those local organizations to make it work. Um, so we work with um, various recovery organizations. We also work with the local HUD counseling organizations or the local um, non-HUD counseling organizations that are out there in an area. Um, because we know that what we're serving, that consumer who says, I would much rather talk to, about my money to somebody on the phone or just via text message. Like I need that emotional distance from my money. That is not the same consumer that's going to walk into an office, right? Um, but that consumer who wants to walk into an office and say, like, here are all the letters that my bank has sent me since my disaster, right? Um, that consumer needs more than what we can just give them over the phone. And so collaborating with them to figure out, like, how can we make sure we're serving everybody? Um, and how can MMI provide back office support, right? The, the challenge is the, the local HUD organization in an area or the... the primarily HUD organization in an area, um, they are they're the size they need to be to provide for the needs of that community um, when no disaster is going on, right? And so asking them to suddenly take on an incredible amount of additional work is uh, it's super stressful. It very frequently blows out all of their grants right away. 
Um, their staff is also struggling to recover. Um, and so anything we can do on the back end to let them continue to be the face of the work and where we provide um, additional support and additional help for us, that's a big win. And, and we have, because of our size, the grants um, to cover it and to do that. Um, and then we also need the network of other nonprofits in the area because, like I said, we uh, we exclusively handle the money part. So as soon as somebody needs something that is not not doesn't have anything to do with their money, we need somebody to get that consumer to. And and if the local organizations weren't on the ground doing it, we we wouldn't be able to be successful in our work. To answer my question, I'm going to provide a little background. In 2020, the Washington Post, excuse me, 2021, the Washington Post sent out an article that talked about FEMA appeals and FEMA awards. And they stated that between 2017 and 2021, 66% um, of survivors who applied to FEMA were denied assistance. And then from the months of January to May of 2021, 87% of survivors were denied FEMA assistance. Across the nation, 4% of survivors appeal. So we want partners who want to play a role in the appeals process. And how we do that is we provide training. Um, we want everyone in the community to have as much FEMA appeals knowledge, FEMA assistance knowledge as possible to be able to assist survivors on your own uh, and and contribute to increasing that 4%. We also provide a resource to nonprofit organizations, case managers, long-term recovery groups through the trainings, but also um, allowing them to refer survivors over to us so that we can do that one small piece. Obviously, with case management, there's a lot more involved in the whole disaster recovery um, than just FEMA appeals. And so being able to lift a little bit of the burden off the case manager by being able to file the appeal for that survivor and remain in the loop with the case manager on that is, is really important. Additionally, especially for the most marginalized survivors, it's sometimes difficult for them to supply us with the correct documentation or provide us with information that we need, whereas a case manager can supply that information to us, or a long-term recovery group can supply that information to us. And so those are some few ways in which we partner with organizations. Additionally, with our grant funding, we are able to cover the cost of contractor estimates, which is a key piece to home repair appeals. Every FEMA home repair appeal requires a contractor estimate. And so there are also times when we partner with nonprofit organizations, case management, who are filing the appeals on their own, yet the survivor cannot afford a contractor estimate. And so we cover the costs of that. Um, we want to see as many people as possible maximizing their eligible amount of funding from FEMA. That's our goal, whether we do it or somebody else does it. All right. Well, thank you very much.